Thanks, Micah. Good morning, everyone, and happy Friday, and hope everyone is staying dry and warm despite the lovely weather out there today. I am going to turn it over first to Dr. Stanislaus to join us for um, some updated information on COVID and what we need to know. Yes. Um, so we have some uh, good news. Um, the one of the things that we are seeing is across the state, uh, COVID rates are dropping, but it is not dropping steeply. Over the last week or two, for the last week, it has been kind of plateauing. It kind of came down, and it is kind of plateauing right now. Uh, but overall, the rates are significantly less than what it used to be, but still it is not to the point where the transmission is so low that we can undo all the mitigation efforts. At this point, in order to keep it going down or at least made it in the plateau, we need to continue our mitigation efforts, which means uh, masking when you are in given gatherings and also maintaining distance and also not being in you know, unmasked with in large gatherings. So this is very, very important. Um, the other good news that we came or the other news that we have this 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 uh, this week uh, from CDC is the booster shots. So we have now booster shots approved for um, all three vaccines, Pfizer, Moderna and J and J. Now Pfizer, uh, the third dose or the sorry, the booster dose had been approved, I think, at least um, three weeks or longer. But for Moderna and J&J, &J, it was just approved. And this again, the booster shots are not for everybody. Now, um, while I'm speaking, feel free to get your questions um, to me so I can answer uh, your questions after I give information on the booster shots. So. Uh, again, the booster shots are not for everybody. The CDC has recommended who should take the booster shots. First, I'm going to talk about Pfizer and Moderna because they're very similar. And then I'll talk about J&J. &J. So who are the uh, individuals who are eligible for the booster shots? Number one, age 65 and older. So anybody who is 65 and older is eligible for the booster shot. Number two is anyone who's 18 years or older and who lives in a long-term care setting, which includes like a HAB center, a, a group home, when you have multiple individuals from, uh, from different families living together in any kind of a group, uh, any kind of a group home would also be considered a long-term care setting. So anybody in a nursing home, a uh, group home, a uh, hospital, like in a psychiatric hospital, in a HAP center, or any time there's a congregate living arrangement or that is a long-term care settings would be considered, so 18 and older in long-term care settings. Number three is age 18 and older who have underlying medical, medical conditions. And then the CDC goes on to say, what those underlying medical conditions that we currently have evidence for higher risk of COVID, or if they do have, if they do catch COVID, then the risk of um, them having severe symptoms or ending up in a hospital or having a negative outcome. So those are the individuals, so if they have those medical conditions and they contract COVID, then they have a, 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 a worse outcome than those without these medical conditions. So I'm going to go through some of those medical conditions now. One is cancer. Anybody who's had a diagnosis of cancer and going through treatment for cancer, or even if they're in remission for cancer, I would definitely consider this as underlying condition. Um, chronic kidney disease. Anytime you have a kidney disease, kidney, any kind of kidney disease is considered to be a high risk condition. Chronic lung disease. Uh, which includes um, COPD, interstitial lung disease, or anything you have a uh, lung disease, even asthma can be considered a lung disease uh, for this particular purpose. Uh, chronic liver disease, such as alcoholic cirrhosis, or any, any kind of uh, condition that has caused hepatitis, 
or liver conditions, people who are suffering from diabetes mellitus, be it type 1 or type 2, um, heart conditions such as heart failure, if you've had a heart, heart, if one has had a heart attack in the past, any of those, um, and anything, um, and also the serious mental disorders, especially those with schizophrenia, have been considered to be high risk. Uh, obesity, people who have had uh, a BMI of 30 or higher, um, pregnancy or recent pregnancy, and even even people who are smokers. Um, and so these are kind of kind of some of the medical conditions, underlying medical conditions that they are found to have a uh, high risk uh, um, or consider high risk for negative outcome if they contract COVID and these individuals, for these individuals, they recommend a booster. Another one condition, especially that's applicable to adult with disabilities or those who have adult with disabilities and they have contracted COVID, they have found to uh, have a, a much more uh, worse outcome than those who do not have developmental disabilities. And hence, uh, individuals even who are living at home, um, if, if uh, they're eligible and if they're between the ages of 18 and above, and uh, they should have, I would strongly recommend a booster based on the recommendation from, uh, from CDC. So we talked about age 65 and older. We talked about individuals 18 and older who live in long-term care settings. We talked about age 18 and older who have underlying medical conditions and I went through those. And we also have, um, also you're eligible for age 18 and over who work or live in high-risk settings. And this is where um, many of the medical care workers or, um, or skilled nursing uh, who work in nursing homes, who work in uh, long-term facilities um, will qualify and that will be a significant number of our DMH employees or our DMH contract employees or uh, who work in the community providers, um, staff who work in for the community. So uh, they also, CDC also has um, noted who these um, and these, these individuals would be. So examples of workers who may get the COVID-19 booster shots, first responders, they define that as healthcare workers, firefighters, police, congregate care staff. So I'll go through those again. Uh, first responders who are healthcare workers, firefighters, police, and congregate care staff. Uh, educational staff, mainly teachers, support staff, daycare workers, people who work in the food and agriculture, food and agriculture workers, manufacturing workers, correctional workers, US Postal Service workers, public transit workers, and grocery store workers. So these are the people who, who they consider who work and live in high risk uh, settings and between the ages of 18 and 64. All right, so um, let me go through this one more time. Who are the individuals eligible for booster? 65 and older, 18 plus who live in long-term care settings, 18 plus who have underlying medical conditions, and 18 plus who work or live in high-risk high, high risk settings. So when should you get your booster uh, for uh, booster for Pfizer or Madonna? They recommend that at least six months after your second shot. So um, if it's been six months, which most of us who have got the two shot, um, the two first and second shot for Moderna and Pfizer uh, by April should be eligible. So it must be six months after you got the second shot for Pfizer or Moderna. Um, so um, now let's talk about J Johnson & Johnson, the J&J &J vaccine. So it was a single dose vaccine so what the CDC currently recommends is you can get a second dose of J and J if you are two months if it's at least two months before your first dose. So individuals who had who meet the booster dose requirements and if they got their first dose as of Janssen and Janssen and if it's two months since they got the Janssen and Janssen, Janssen vaccine J and J vaccine, they should be able to able to get it now. Um, their second dose. So uh, there's also another provision 
that has come up uh, with mix and matching of vaccines. So can we mix, can somebody who has had Pfizer before get a J&J now, or was someone who's had J&J before get Pfizer now? So uh, they looked at some research and what they found is individuals who had a mixing of uh, vaccines, uh, say from an mRNA, people got an mRNA before, which is Pfizer and Moderna, and then they got a J&J or people got a J&J first and now they're getting an uh, mRNA vaccine. They found that the, the amount of neutralizing antibodies that the body produced was much higher. They thought it was 50 times to 70 times higher um, than when they got the same dosage again. So based on this, um, CDC has recommended that you could do a mix and match, meaning that if you got J&J the first time around uh, and it's already two months before you, by the time you got your first dose, you can go take a Pfizer or a Moderna dosage uh, as your second vaccine. Same thing if individuals have had Pfizer or Moderna and it's already six months past your second dosage, and they want to take a J&J as their uh, booster dose, they can do that as well. I know there's a lot of information here. Um, I'm open to taking questions. Feel free to get your, um, you know, if you have any chat question, please uh, send it uh, to the panelists and we will address that. Now, where can you get them? That's a good question. So we do have the state does have standing order, which all pharmacy, um, your primary care physicians can give it if your offices are giving it. Federally qualified health centers, uh, wherever you are getting your uh, vaccine initially, should be able to give it to you. Uh, right now, CVS and Walgreens, um, Hy-Vee, all the pharmacies in Missouri are able to give the vaccination. And it's so easy to go online, get an appointment and getting it. I got mine um last week and i took it at the same time you can get your flu vaccine and your covid booster at the same time i got my flu vaccine my right arm uh, uh, and my covid booster on my left arm and had no issues so that is something you recommended and it's a flu season i strongly recommend taking the flu vaccine as well so you can take both at the same time um when you make an appointment to do in your farm and when you do your pharmacy Again, um, booster, how do you do it? You just, when you sign up for the booster on the website in, uh, in your pharmacy, or you make a phone call to find uh, sign up, there is actually a self-attestation form. Basically, you just say you qualify for the booster. Um, they don't need any documentation to show that you can, you need the booster. It is a self-attestation. Um, the other thing is also, uh, Take your booster card with you. If you've already had your first and second dose or just one dose with Janssen, take your card with you when you go to the pharmacy. It helps them really identify the lot and when you, the date you got it. And also they will add the third booster dose or the second booster dose uh, in the card. So you have one nice card with all your vaccination details in there. That's all I have. Any questions? Dr. Stanislaus, we have one question that came in that just for clarification, it says, I thought I read that if you got the J&J &J shot originally, you are eligible for a booster now if you are over age 18, regardless of health, living situation, profession, et cetera. Is that correct? That is correct. Thank you for pointing that. Yes, if you are got a J&J &J and it's two months since your last post, anybody, everybody, there is no pre-request. You can just go in and get another J&J or, um, or an mRNA vaccine, any of the Pfizer or Moderna. You're absolutely correct. And thank you for pointing that out. And that's the only question that we have today. Well, in that case, all have a nice weekend and I, and be safe. And I hand it over to Station MD. I think Dr. Trevedi is on. Hi, how are you? Thanks, Dr. Stanislaw. Uh, thank you all. Um, I, I'm going to be very brief. Um, Dr. Stanislaus covered a lot of, of what I think is important, um, but I was uh, just going to speak real briefly about breakthrough infections because there's been some questions about that. Uh, and then very briefly touch on um, the Merck pill, which is an antiviral, which you may have heard about or read about. 
Um, so let me start first with the breakthrough infections. Um, the one thing I will emphasize, uh, a few things I'll emphasize is that um, there are no vaccines that are 100% effective. Um, and every vaccine has, there, there's going to be some people that get vaccinated. Um, you know, if you probably had the flu vaccine, some people still, you still get the flu. Um, and this vaccine that's out there, all of them is, are, are extremely effective in preventing um, uh, COVID-19. More importantly, extremely effective at preventing serious COVID-19 hospitalization and death. Um, so on the order of 90% effective, uh, as I mentioned, nothing is 100%, 100%, 100 effective, but the key here is how important it is to get vaccinated in terms of preventing serious illness and hospitalization and death. And that has been consistent. Um, what I will tell you about breakthrough infections is that, first of all, they do occur. It is extremely rare. Um, and the data that has come out very recently has shown that even with the Delta var variant, when the Delta variant spiked, the majority, uh, six to 10 times the, the other, uh, of the people that had uh, developed infections were those that were unvaccinated. Very small amount of individuals that were vaccinated ended up getting a breakthrough infection that was severe. Um, so so that, that really is the take home, take home message. Um, so a few points I wanna make that, again, uh, just wanna hammer home is that the vaccine, all of them protect against serious disease. Nothing is 100%. Number two, it's extremely rare to get uh, a serious infection after getting the vaccine, um, both doses. Um, there have been some individuals that are more prone to get it if they've only partially finished the course uh, uh, for those that are two course um, uh, vaccinations. Um, the other thing I, I think is really critical to emphasize is that vaccinations decreases the person to person spread. So it's another reason to get vaccinated. Um, but the take home message with the breakthrough cases is they are rare, extremely rare in those that are vaccinated and the cases that, that do happen that are severe are still happening in the unvaccinated population. Um, lastly, I just wanna really briefly touch on um, the, the antiviral pill that you may have heard about through Merck. Um, and, and what it is, is it's an oral antiviral medication. Um, if you've heard of something called Tamiflu, which is an antiviral for flu, this is very similar. In fact, it has a similar mechanism of action as well. We do have other antivirals. I've administered them myself many times, but they're intravenous, they're IV, meaning you have to go to the hospital and get them. Those are the monoclonal antibodies kind of work against the virus. There's something called remdesivir, which is an antiviral. But this new pill that's in development uh, by Merck is an oral, meaning when your signs and symptoms of COVID appear early on, you go get a prescription for this pill. Um, and uh, it has shown in early, early studies to reduce the risk of hospitalization and death uh, by half. Um, again, it's not approved to my knowledge. All of this is a moving target, so it, it may have been today, but from my understanding, it is still no FDA emergency approval um, and it is still in, in the work. So um, the theory and thought is, is that th this pill, when you develop early symptoms of COVID, you would take it uh, and it would prevent, again, not uh, eliminate the disease or prevent the disease, but prevent uh, serious disease from occurring and hospitalization from occurring. Uh, again, there is still no FDA official approval that I'm aware of. Um, and if there would be, it would be an emergency use authorization, such as the vaccine was, um, with the hope of it being uh, officially approved. What I do know is so far, the safety profile of the pill is very good. Um, they did uh, stop the early trials because of such a, a great success rate. Um, it is an oral formulation. I don't know the exact, but it's something like you take two pills a day for five days. Um, and uh, the other thing that has been recently in the news is that uh, Merck has um, licensed its use for, for other countries, for poorer countries to use. And, and that's something that's very positive um, that have low vaccination rates. All that being said, uh, this by no means is a cure. It is simply to mitigate some of the symptoms, very much like Tamiflu, to reduce the severity of those infections. Um, and again, the early preliminary studies have shown that it has reduced the risk of severe infection and hospitalization by half. So uh, TBD, we're gonna keep following um, what happens here um, and we'll alert all of you as it goes along. But uh, right now it is not approved for use, but uh, has promising. Um, I look at it as simply another um, weapon or arsenal against COVID, um, but combined with 
strong vaccination efforts combined with strong um, uh, risk reduction whenever possible. Uh, and in addition, now we have, would have an oral form formulation that's an antiviral um, will help really er eradicate the spread. Because the goal is the less people that get infected, the less ch chances this uh, virus gets to mutate and turn into a more virulent form. So um, that's it. Uh, I'm not sure who is next on the agenda, but, but thank you all and uh, have a great weekend. Thanks so much, Dr. Shabetti. It is really great to have you and Dr. Stanislaus on here on a regular basis to make sure that our stakeholders all have the, the good, clear information regarding um, what we can do with COVID and, and how to access the right care for those that we serve. And so the next part of the update is going to be a little bit of a uh, mixture of information and kind of go back a little bit because he's not been with you in a month and that was not planned. Um, so we're going to call half of this the gas leak agenda. Um, Heike called it that and I think that was an appropriate name. And so uh, we couldn't be with you two weeks ago because there was an unexpected gas leak in the building, but everything's fine and um, we are, we're back. Um, so one of the things that happened um, that we planned on telling you about and making sure that everyone was aware of is that the federal public health emergency was extended. So now, now the end of the federal public health emergency is set for January, let's see, 22nd, or no, January 16th of 2022, too many dates in my head. So January 16th of 2022 is the end of the federal public health emergency and a lot of the flexibilities that are in place to make sure that we can provide the right care and mitigation and um, get the training that we need during this time period um, is hinged on those flexibilities and the authority within that public health emergency. I'm going to have Heike navigate to what we call the COVID-19 flexibility chart. And this is on the website under the COVID-19 page link. And really some important things to know um, about the flexibilities in here, which range from um, training that can be online versus in person and different things that are waived um, requirements that are normally there. Um, so the big thing to know and the important pieces is to be aware of everything within here that is currently waived or a flexibility and to know when it will expire or when it will possibly expire so that you can be expecting that. So right now, the state flexibilities, the state public health emergency is set to expire on December 31st of this year. And if the flexibility within this chart is hinging on both a federal and a state, um, either regulatory or statutory waiver, then the earlier of the two applies. So if the uh, state public health emergency were not to be extended beyond December 31st, then any of the, the flexibilities within this chart um, that rely on regulation or statutory waivers will go away. Um, on after December 31st. One of the questions that we did get is regarding some of the trainings that were online um, and the certifications that come with them and would, um, would those still um, apply um, the certification and the training be good for the, the time period? And yes. So um, just to clarify, not everyone on January 1st, if it happens to not be extended um, on January 1st, you don't have to go and do in-person training to make sure that you're still good. Um, that certification or training will last through the appropriate time period and then the expectation is the next time that it will be done in person. Um, the other thing to know is that anything with an 1135 flexibility ends upon the end of the public health emergency at the federal level. And then anything with an Appendix K um, approval, that is six months, um, no later than six months following the public health emergency. So once the um, public health emergency at the federal level has ended, 
we as a state will work with um, providers and stakeholders to unwind and get back to normal operations from any of those federal flexibilities. Um, one more thing, I know many of the individuals that we serve um, have not um, had to pay their spend down to maintain Medicaid eligibility during this time period. That is still in place and that ends upon the end of the federal public health emergency. So that is one that's tied to the, to the end date of the federal public health emergency, just like the 1135 waiver is. Okay, um, one of the other things that is kind of hot off the press is that, um, as you may have read in the news this morning and, and late yesterday, the uh, Build Back Better Reconciliation Framework was released um, from the Democrats and President Biden. Um, and so we have a framework of what that may look like um, as it goes through um, through the process from here. Um, but there are a lot of things that apply to our programs and those that we serve, including an, ex an estimated 150 billion for Medicaid home and community-based services, um, which includes a 6% um, FMAP enhancement for uh, quite a period of time, a 2% FMAP enhancement for um, self-direction um, expansion, uh, there's also approximately one billion that's going to be applied to um, in this version for HCBS workforce development. Um, so I encourage you, if you have not um, gone out and kind of reviewed that yet, um, to to look through and 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 look at the current status. Uh, and we at the division will be working with stakeholders to kind of even though we don't know what that final version will look like yet, we'll be planning for um, the possibilities and make sure that we are in a good place when that, when that passes and we have a good plan going forward um, to make the best use of that money for our system and for those we serve. Uh, one more thing I did wanna talk about is that the um, Missouri Alliance for Dual Diagnosis Summit for 2021 is next Tuesday, and I'm registered. You should definitely take advantage of this great um, education opportunity. It is 1030 to 2, and we have some great speakers lined up, including um, Dr. John Constantino and Valerie Kuhn and other um, individuals to talk about these really um, kind of challenging situations um, that this, this population encounters and how best to serve them. Um, so we invite you to attend this free event and, and hope that you will take advantage of that. And with that, I am gonna turn it over for some more updates to Angie. Thank you, Jess. I have a, just a quick update. Um, all of the rates from the rate increases from the last uh, budget session have been updated in Seymour with the exception of self-directed. We're still working on that and updating the authorizations. Um, rebillings of those prior, um, so through July, July through September, group home, personal assistant, ISL, RN, and LPN claims have been processed. So thank you to all the team members that did that. Regional offices are still manually working on uh, the rebills for the ISLs. So, um, the provider's patients, um, just the continuance of that patients is greatly appreciated. I know that takes a lot of time. Um, but most importantly, we wanna let you know that providers can start billing now that rates have been updated um, effective October and on. So um, just didn't want providers to feel like they had to hold on to those billings still. So make sure you start sending those in. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Emily. Thank you. Hi, good morning. Um, a update from the federal directors um, uh, from the FPU unit today. Um, the approval of the waivers and amendments were followed up by with service definition training, and that was held on October 12th with 647 attendees. The, record, the recording presentation and programmatic change document is available on the division's um, previous webinar page. We also um, are holding three live Q&A sessions, two of which that have already been held on October 21st and October 25th. 
The first session had 448 attendees and the second session had 348 attendees. The third session is scheduled for November 4th at um, 2 to 3 p.m. and that will cover behavior and crisis relation and PAM. So the registration for that session is available on the division's upcoming webinar page and you can find that probably in the chat. I guess probably if you need that um, link, we can provide that link for the webinars registering. So that third session, it will um, include uh, intensive therapeutic residential habilitation and community transition crisis intervention, applied behavior analysis and professional assessment and monitoring. Another um, update and reminder, EVV or electronic visit verification applies to personal care service providers, including the Division of De Development Disabilities personal assistant providers. It's imperative that all PA providers register with SAN data, the EVV aggregator, and complete that training. The EVV goes live November 8th. So um, if personal assistant providers fail to complete this online EVV vendor registration, it, they may be subject to having one or more admin sanctions listed in the state reg. So it's really important to make sure they get that process started and get registered with uh, SAN data if you're a PA provider. That's all the um, updates I have, and I'm going to pass it up to um, pass it to, I think Jess to wrap up, or Leslie if Leslie has a update for COVID-19. Um, I sure do. Okay, and thanks, Leslie. Yes, thank you so much, Emily. Um, good morning. I'm Leslie DeGroat, your division's clinical coordinator. And this morning, I'm going to give you a reminder of the guidance regarding reporting DD service participants who have a positive COVID-19 test result. The expectation is still that the positive COVID cases will be entered into our event reporting system. We will put the link in the, in, to the guidance in the chat box. Um, please review it and ensure that your agencies are reporting the positive cases. That way, we can be aware of these cases and be able to pro provide you the supports that you may need. Um, our regional office registered nurses follow up as needed on a case by case basis in order to make sure that you have what you need to support you and your staff with keeping the individuals um, who, that we serve as safe as possible and help you get through if you have an outbreak or even if you have a few cases. Uh, we're always here to, to support you. Um, and before I hand off to Jess, I have one more reminder. As we are into fall and moving into winter, winter please don't forget to get your flu shot unless your doctor says otherwise. Um, also, I want to reiterate and tag on to the wise words of Dr. Stanislaus and Dr. Trevetti. Um, we are not out of the woods yet with COVID. So remember, in order to stay safe and keep others safe, be mindful about large gatherings and crowds, wear your masks when appropriate, stay home when you are sick, Wash your hands and please get vaccinated if you can. Um, thank you very much and have an excellent rest of your day. And I will now hand off to Jess. Thanks, Leslie. Appreciate that update and thanks, Ange and Emily. Um, we did get one question in the chat that we are going to go back and check on um, regarding the key logs and group comms, and we'll get back to that individual separately. Um, appreciate everyone's time today and hope you have a wonderful um, holiday weekend and get some trick-or-treating in. All right, thanks, bye.